Okay, today I'm revisiting author Jamie Reid. Thanks very much uh, for talking to me again, Jamie. My um, pleasure. And the reason we're revisiting you is you've written a book on Victor Chandler. Victor Chandler put your life on it. It's the authorised biography. Yep. Um, how did that come about? Just tell us from the start, how did that happen? Well, it, it goes back a long way, actually. Um, I got to know Victor in the 1990s to begin with, and I, I, I was aware of the, of the history of the family and the fact that his father and grandfather were legendary bookmakers. And then around the time when um, he was moving offshore, um, I did a newspaper interview with him. Um, it was for the old, for the independent. And I met Victor uh, in the RAC club in London, very uh, smart and comfortable setting for a drink at his suggestion. And he came in and he said, look, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to, you know, I can only do about half an hour most, you know, etc." Anyway, we started chatting and I started asking questions about his father and grandfather. And he started opening up about the family history and we got on really well. And it was terrific fun. And we were there for about two hours and he, and he you know, forgot the, and then he decided he'd cancel his next appointment. And as, we, as he left the building, I said to him, have you ever thought of doing a biography or a book or a history of all of this, of your family? Because it's a wonderful story. And he said, yes, I have thought about it and it ought to be done soon. Otherwise the old members of the family are gonna die. Um, so that was, you know, over 20 years ago. And it took, uh, uh, you know, it's taken all the intervening period to actually finally make it happen. And it was always going to be dependent on when he had either sold the business or he had stepped down from running it. And then he would feel more able to talk, uh, frankly, about various aspects of his family's history and his experience. So it's been a long time coming <laughs> and there were more bumps along the road, believe you me. OK, you can tell us about them in a bit. Um, just just give us um, you've told us, a, you know, it's about Victor Chandler and about his family. But just give us a, a bit of a synopsis. Just a bit more meat on the bones. Yeah, absolutely. Well, anybody who went racing in the in the 80s and 90s, particularly, you'll remember Victor on the rails. He was a colossus of, of the ring in those days, next door to people like Stephen Little. Um, he laid the really big bets at Cheltenham, at Royal Ascot. He'd take on any punter. And there was a tremendous atmosphere always around the pitch. And the fascinating part of all that is that it's literally in, in the blood with him. His grandfather, Bill Chandler, was a proper rogue. He was, he was a rascal, he was a street bookie, he was a bookies runner in London, in Hoxton, in the years before and after World War I. And, and a bit like, as one of the old family members said to me, there was a bit of Don Corleone about Bill. Um, he, he worked his way up from, from being a runner for other street bookies to having his own pitches, and then he acquired his own business on the race course, betting at the dog tracks and at the major racing events. And by the 1930s, he'd opened Walthamstow Greyhound Stadium, seeing the future of dog racing, which at the time looked very promising and very bright. And he'd become a rich man. And he had seven sons. And Victor's father, Victor Senior, was the youngest. And when Bill Chandler died in 1946, Victor Senior took over the, the, the bookmaking side, not without a certain amount of, 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 of fractious, fractious stuff going on between him and some of his brothers. And Victor Senior was, a, was by all accounts a charming man, a good looking man, a very well dressed man, but he loved bookmaking and he loved being on the race course. He wasn't a businessman. And in 1974, he died very young of liver and bowel cancer and young Victor, as they called him, uh, suddenly found himself inheriting the business age 23. And up to that point, he'd led, as he, he would cheerfully acknowledge, a misspent youth. He'd been kicked out of various um, fee-paying schools. He'd been constantly in trouble with his father for getting into various escapades here and abroad. Um, and he didn't really know anything in, in terms of proper concrete knowledge about how you, how you work and survive as a bookie. Fortunately, there were some very good people who had worked for his father, who were around, who were able to help him and try and teach him the game. And he, he, he nearly chucked it all in a few years after his father's death, but he kept going and he changed his style. He became more confident. And then he hit that period in the 80s when there was a lot of money around and, and he loved it. And, and going racing three or four days a week was, was absolutely the thing he lived for. Um, and as we know, 
it 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 had its heyday in in the 80s and into the 90s and then there were the economic problems of the 90s and a lot of high rolling gamblers and racehorse owners were dying out or packing up and so Victor was advised by a friend, if you want to carry on, if you still want to survive in this game, you're going to have to look elsewhere. You're going to have to look to the Far East. And so he started traveling out to places like Hong Kong and uh, Thailand, Indonesia, looking to see if he could legitimately and legally have a presence out there, which would encourage those punters to bet with him. And he was offering, obviously, you know, no tax and, and, and the, 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 the instigation that, that, that was the biggest part of his, his evolution from that point was moving to Gibraltar in 1999, taking the whole business offshore because the British betting tax at that time was ruinously expensive. Um, and that in turn led on to the rise of online gambling um, and the business just got bigger and bigger. But everybody who knows Victor well will say that he was really, he's always been at his happiest on a race course. He'd far rather have been at Cheltenham or even, even Plumpton or Faultwell than he would really sitting behind a desk looking at a spreadsheet. Again, that's interesting for me that the, uh, the book's about a dynasty of uh, successful bookmakers, but there's a foreword by the late, and in my opinion, great Barney Curley. Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. Barney and Victor were, were you know, they were the best of enemies, if you know what I mean. They were, they, they were friends, I mean, um, and Barney, it's great train. It's tragic on obviously many, many grounds that he's he's died. I wish he was here now to talk about it. And he talked about Victor very thoughtfully and very interestingly. And he would he respected Victor and he respected his father, because if if Barney wanted a price, they would generally lay him. And if he won, even if he'd been plotting up some ingenious coup, they'd pay up. And in turn, Victor respected Barney's knowledge and judgment of horse racing. And Barney put him right on a number of instances, you know, where the where the herd were all rushing after and backing one particular horse and Barney would warn him against it and it'd give him his reasons for why, why as a bookmaker he should stand that horse and be backing something else. And they they got on very well. And uh, we've already mentioned that the, uh, the book covers a dynasty, three generations. Did you have to turn that genealogist uh, or was the family history already well documented? Because you've got an actual family tree and stuff in there. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we managed, uh, Victor found one old relation of his who had that family tree, which we put in at the front of the book to try and help people with all the names. But no, absolutely. I was lucky enough to be, as it was an authorised biography, which people will understand comes with certain uh, things that you have aspects that, that are not not the same if you were, if you were writing it without the permission of the figure you're writing about um, but given that it was an authorized biography he introduced me to lots of his family members and to old friends who had worked for the firm and that was fascinating meeting some of these old gents in their 80s um, his mother's cousin Ben O'Miller Ben Miller who's also dead now Ben was a commission agent in the days when they used to put money on for wealthy, well-to-do punters, you know, weren't quite sure how to handle the bookies in person. Ben knew absolutely everybody in the racing game. We're going right back to the 40s and the 50s. He remembers Victor's grandfather in the 30s. Um, I talked to Victor's mother. There was his wonderful aunt Frances. She was the one who loved dog racing. She was married to his uncle Charles, who took over the running of the stadium at Walthamstow after, after the grandfather died. And Frances was the most fabulous lady, very glamorous, well into her 80s, with beautiful silver grey hair, always very dressed up at the stow. She'd be up there, as they all used to say, she'd be there with her sparklers, her rings, her earrings, her cigarettes. She had a gravel voice like Lauren Bacall. She had a glass of wine. She knew everything about dog racing. And she lived well into her 80s and only died a few years ago. And then there was his uncle, Ronnie. Um, he was a hilarious character. Um, he was, I think, the, in, in, in the pecking order of the seven brothers, Victor's father was the youngest one, Ronnie was the second to youngest, and he'd gone out to Ireland to train greyhounds, both for coursing and for, for stadium racing, and he was a charmer, very good looking gentleman, perfect manners, a real ladies man, as they used to say in those days, and um, I had one unforgettable trip to meet him down in um, Adair in County Limerick, getting down to kind of J.P. McManus territory down around there in the Dunraven Arms. 
And, um, oh, that was a wild night. And he had this lovely friend, Dave Carhill, who owned dogs and horses. And Dave was telling me that Ronnie used to give Dave's dogs a sip of brandy before a race. And I said, you know, did that make them run any faster? And he said, no, he said, but you could say they were the happiest dog at the meeting, which was, you know, and they were, they were fantastic characters. And it was all those sort of people who were able to fill me in on the, on the historic family details. Okay, now you're talking about characters. You've already mentioned that um, Victor's grandfather, William Bill Chandler, 1890 to 1946, was a bit of a rascal. He was. Give us a little, give us a little bit more without ruining the read for people. Okay, right. Well, there were, there were various ways. Bill, he was a big man, a strong man, an imposing man, very handsome in his way. I always felt, looking at the photographs of him, he looked a bit like the actor Robert Newton, who, who played Long John Silver in a famous old English film of Treasure Island years ago. He was always impeccably dressed with his trilby hats and his tailor-made suits and coats. Um, but he was a tough man. As, as one person said to me, he was a leader of men. There was one occasion where William Hill allegedly owed Bill money. And Bill went to see him with his minder, who was known as Charlie the Hammer. Charlie Maskey Sr. And as people say, Charlie the Hammer's uh, nickname didn't have anything to do with his uh, dexterity at um, you know, fixing up the house. It, was, uh, it, was a, it could be called upon in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a regrettably violent situation to, um, to be the last man standing. And Charlie and Bill went to see William Hill. And William Hill was so nervous when he knew that they were coming, he had, him, he had himself locked in a cupboard. Um, and they got the money. And uh, Hill turned up later at Northolt Park, where they used to have pony racing, and he was wearing plus fours. And this became a, a, a continual running joke in the bookmaking fraternity after that. There was another time where Bill confronted somebody else who owed him money in the Nile, as they called it, Nile Street in Hoxton, which is where they all grew up and came from. And Bill used to walk, walk stroll around there in the 30s, as I said, a bit like Marlon Brando in The Godfather. Um, and there was a confrontation with a man who owned him money. Bill knocked him down, but he dislodged the diamond from his diamond ring. And it, 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 they couldn't find it. And they put the word around that if anybody brought it back, you know, they'd be well thanked. And as people said to me, this was the depression when, you know, a lot of people were desperate for money in any way. And so that diamond would be worth a lot of money. But an old lady called um, uh, Mrs. Bevin from Chatham Avenue, she found it and she brought it back again. And Bill gave her one of those lovely, great big white five pound notes. He gave her about four of them and she passed out. She'd fainted. She'd never seen so much money before. Um, and they had to bring her back to life again, fortunately. Um, but the serious stuff that he did, which you're probably going to get onto, was that he had his crew. He had people he could rely on, not just the, the men who were the proper bookmakers, the, the, the men who understood odds, the field men, the guys, the clerks on the track, but he could call on the services if necessary of the so-called Hoxton mob, which was led by a man called Jimmy Spinks. And he found that there were occasions when he needed them uh, in, the, in the confrontations with the Italian mob uh, led by Darby Sabini, who famously appears in Peaky Blinders. 